Good morning. My name is Mike Thurston. I'm on the pastoral team here at Cedar Ridge. And as Matthew said, um, this morning's about experiencing God in silence. Thank you. <laughs> He's got enough of it. So. <laughs> Actually, uh, I'd like to share a little from my personal experience and I think it'll become clear why I'm, I'm sharing on this this morning. Um, so in, in the discipleship group material, there are three ways or forms of prayer, meditation, that you can try this week. <clears throat> there's uh, breath prayer, there's centering prayer, and there's something called examine. And for me, centering prayer has become the central way that I connect with God. Uh, about seven years, I started, seven years ago, I started doing this as a daily practice. And it has become very meaningful to me. Now, I think all of us, if we're, if we're following Christ, if we're practicing Christians, have experienced some point along the way in which our prayer, uh, our devotional life is not so great, or it just it gets dry, or it feels like going through the motions. Right before I started doing this centering prayer, maybe for a period of a couple of years, I can't, I can't remember, but I found that I could not pray at all. I mean, I'd been a practicing Christian for decades. I knew about uh, how to intercede for others and pray for others. I knew about worship. I knew about prayers of thanksgiving. You know, I could do all that. But for some reason, at this point in my life, it all dried up. I, for the life of me, I could not pray. So I you know I was going to church and I was doing reading the Bible and things, but this part of my life had just gone dead. And I was I was led to to read about uh, meditation and contemplation in the Christian tradition, and and uh, I ran across a book by Father Thomas Keating called uh, Open Mind, Open Heart. And Keating and some others have decided, you know, there's some great things we do in the monasteries that the lay people don't get. So let's, let's take some of that and teach it to lay people in a form that fits into their busy lives and that they can use. And hence a book like Open Heart, Open Mind, which is about centering prayer. And centering prayer is basically uh, using a sacred word to return to and open ourselves to God in the process of all these distracting thoughts and becoming still like Matthew was talking about. And this, the central passage for this morning is be still and know that I'm God. So we're going to be talking about the challenges of being still, maybe some ways to help you be still. But anyway, as, as I begin to do this, I found, you know, Matthew talked about some things fit us and some things don't. This practice for some reason fit me to a T. And when I would, uh, I, I commute from Columbia to Washington, D.C. every, well, Monday through Friday. And the, the commuter bus becomes the place of prayer for me to do this, to do this practice. I catch a bus at 5.40 in the morning, and, and people on the bus are not very loud at that point in the morning. <laughs> some of them are snooze, and some of them are doing, you know, the, the electronic devices are omnipresent at this point people. But the lights are off and it's a great time to do sending prayer. So that became, that became a place for me to do this. And I found that over time I've become more and more adept at sustaining periods of silence and connecting with God in a powerful way. So it's out of this experience I'm kind of humbled to, to even be able to share, share with you this morning in this area. So to start, let's, let's back way up. Let's, let's back up to to Jesus' experience, Jesus' example. We're going to look at a passage in Luke, the Gospel of Luke. It's verses 5, 15 through 16. And it says, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So, so that first sentence, first thing that strikes you is uh, 
you know, a lot of us are busy, but I don't think you could outdo Jesus for being busy. That he was constantly pressed with crowds of people wanting healing, people interested in his teaching. You know, he'll, he'll heal a blind man there, uh, raise a sick child here, give the Sermon on the Mount at 10 o'clock. Uh, you know, one thing after another. And yet, Jesus often withdrew. He had a habit, he had a practice of withdrawing from all of that. And I think that the, the phrase lonely places is very evocative. He deliberately set, sought out a place of solitude, of quiet, a lonely place. And he prayed. And you know, throughout the Gospels, Jesus keeps referring to my Father. And, and, it, and it's something that used to bother the religious authorities at the time. He seemed to, he seemed to talk about God in such, a, in such familiar terms. Because he had this, he had this deep connection with the Father, and I think it came out of not only this, but certainly key to that was his times of withdrawing to lonely places. And so, what what does that say to us? I think I think it says something to us about what what will help us is to find a place of solitude, to find times to pray like that. But one thing I'm I'm struck with if we go to this next passage in the Gospel of John. Uh, over years of looking at this passage in John, I've come to believe Jesus really wanted us to experience the Father as He experienced the Father. That might be a radical. That might be a radical thought because you think, well, Jesus' spiritual life has got to be way above our spiritual life. Right? He's Jesus. But but I think as we read the, read this from the from the point of view. The heart of Jesus, you know, right before he's arrested, killed, suffering, all of that, as he's leaving his disciples, this is, this is what's on his heart. He says, if you really love me, you will keep the commandments I've given you. I will ask the Father to give you someone else to stand by you, to be with you always. And by that I mean the spirit of truth whom the world cannot accept, for it can neither see nor recognize that spirit. But you recognize him, for he is with you now and will be in your hearts. I am not going to leave you alone in the world. I am coming to you. In a very little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I am really alive, and you, t you will be alive too. When that day comes, you will realize that I am in my Father, that you are in me, and I am in you. Every man who knows my commandments and obeys them is the man who really loves me. Every man who really loves me will himself be loved by my Father. I too will love him and make myself known to him. So I think it's, it's fascinating in that there's a promise of experiencing God. You know, we, in, in Christian terms, we, we speak of the Trinity, but here you have all three persons. You have experiencing God. It's the Spirit and the Father and the Son. And, and just to summarize what's in this, what's in this passage, if we can go to the next slide. I think the promise of experiencing Father, Son, and Spirit includes the following. You will see and recognize Jesus' Spirit in your heart. And in John's language, this seeing is it's a mystical kind of thing. It's, you know, last week we had approaching God through the senses. Your two eyes are part of the senses. The, 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 the contemplative tradition speaks of a third eye or an inner eye that is able to see spiritual reality. And that's what Jesus is referring to. You will see Jesus as he comes to you. I, I strongly believe in this passage when he says, I'm coming to you. This is not a passage about the second coming. This is a passage about a person coming to each of us that love him and open open our hearts to it. You will be fully alive as Jesus is alive, is the promise there. You will experience the love of the Father. Here's that concern. I, Jesus has this wonderful connection. His concern is that we have this connection with the Father. You will realize Jesus is in you as you are in Him. So this, 
You know, Matthew had shared a few weeks ago, a couple of times, about in Ephesians where the, the height, the depth, the width, the length of the love of God is beyond knowing, that we'd experience that, and how that is uh, sometimes feels out of our reach. This is a similar passage, I think, that the promise seems to be there of this fantastic experience, this deep connection. And yet, I think for most of us, maybe all of us, we don't, we, don't, we don't live there. That's not our experience day day by day. That's not our experience in the middle of a workplace when there's a deadline and people are freaking out. You know? That's not our experience when um, there's an argument with somebody we love and we can't seem to get through to them. Of course, we're not listening to them. But yeah. in, in the midst of all that stuff, can that be our experience? And, and so I think, I think the verse we're going to look at next is key to why this is such a challenge. And we have to, we have to come to terms with it. This, this is the central uh, scripture for this week. Be still and know that I am God. And I think, I think it's pretty apparent that uh, the be still part is a prerequisite to know that I am God. Is that Follow it. Be still and know that I am God. Um, and yet the be still part is so hard. It's a, it's a challenge for us. Um, any, any form of meditation you do, uh, any, any contemplative prayer, any centering prayer, whatever it might be, the moment we enter into trying to do this kind of a prayer practice, we become aware of this constant stream of thoughts. This, this, these thoughts that have no beginning and have no end. And there's, it's like there's a thought machine that just generates it. We don't, does it take any effort to think? No, the thoughts are there before you even are aware that you're thinking. And, and to stop those thoughts, to be still, is, is a huge challenge. Because, because part of, and part of the reason is because our very sense of ourself and our existence in this world is so bound up with those thoughts. We are immersed in thoughts. We are making, we're making judgments about people throughout the day, assess, assessing people. We're having imaginary conversations. We're, ha we're about to have an encounter with somebody that we're anxious about, and we'll rehearse that conversation in our head as if we could control it and what they'll say. We, we, uh, we think about our retirement. Will we be able to retire? When can we retire? All those things, to, to silence those, uh, is really difficult. So one, one, of my, one of the things as I was reading about these kind of practices and so on that was helpful to me is to be still. We have, we have to find a way to lighten up, seriously lighten up, um, about our thinking. Because, because we, can, we, can, we can invest so much in our thoughts. Do you know, if someone, if, if we, you know, the, you wouldn't like this, but if we, could, if we could play the soundtrack of your mind over the sound system <laughs> for five minutes, I think most of us would get bored before those five minutes. I think we get bored. But because there are thoughts, Ooh, they're really significant. We're bound up in them. We're immersed in them. We can't silence them. So one of, one of the ways that's helpful in the whole process of being still, to me anyway, was, was to look at my thoughts in a different way. Now one, one metaphor I would offer you is that um, I thought, of, I thought of a bubble machine. How many of you even, how many of you even know who Warren Swalk is? <laughs> okay. He, he had a bubble machine on his show. They would, the bubbles would generate. And uh, so one, one metaphor is to, to realize, to look at our thoughts in a different way. They're thought bubbles that, you know the something? Thoughts don't have discrete beginnings and endings. There's a, there's a little thought fragment that's a bubble and then 
that, that this one's got its own. You know, and they're endless, they keep coming. Um, if you could look, and, and, the, and the human mind has this amazing capacity to think about our thinking. Incredible. To think, to not be immersed in it, but to actually look at what we're thinking. What is that? It's a mystery. But if, if you can look at your, your thought bubbles and see them pop as they go by, it's a way of detaching from your thinking and being still. We are so attached to our thoughts. So part of being still is the ability to detach, see them go by like bubbles. One, one other analogy would be um, the idea of commentary. We, you know, um, you turn on ESPN or MSNBC or anything. The minute you turn on the television, there's commentary, endless commentary, endless babbling. They have to fill their time. They're filling it. The commentary goes on and on about endless things, about commentary about trivial, boring things when you stop to think about it. But the commentary just, it just keeps going. That's, that's the way our mind is. And again, this ability to back up. If, you, if we could listen to our own commentary, that's another way of detaching. Um, I'm going to do I'm going to do a little a thought experiment with you in a minute. But we did this with someone in the child care um, the child care providers at nine o'clock. And she was she was trying to think of her thoughts as thought bubbles, and she had this whole commentary learned about thought bubbles. <laughs> and she said, oh, "That was the commentary." And she saw it, and the minute she saw it, she was not in it. See what I mean? She wasn't. She's no longer immersed in it, and could detach from it. So what I'm, what I'm going to have you do this is a thought experiment. It, it won't run longer than a minute, minute and a half. So don't worry. Um, what what I want you to do, it, it, we're just going to experiment with and practice detaching from our thoughts in one of these two ways. Whatever whatever way fits fits best for you. In other words, the, the thought bubbles are the commentary idea. So, for a minute, minute and a half, as your thinking is going by, see the thoughts go by. Watch them go by as bubbles and watch them pop. Because they're lighter than air. They're not heavy. They don't, they don't solve anything. They don't change the world. They don't, they don't feed your body. They just go by. It's a different way of looking at thoughts. So you can do the thought bubble. You can do the thought bubble method, or you can do the commentary. Listen to the commentary as as the commentary is going by. So either listen to your listen to your commentary, or watch the thought bubbles go by. And by. So one minute. Close your eyes is probably easier. Whatever's thinking is, to watch the bubbles pop, or just listen in on the commentary. Okay. Go for it. Okay, let's, let's stop that for a minute. Um, you know, um, my commentary was, um, I wonder how long I should let this go on. <laughs> I wonder how they're doing with this. Are they thinking this is really weird? Um, but that was my commentary. And see, behind that commentary is an anxious person, or an anxious self. 
But the minute I can see that commentary, I can, I can disassociate from the anxious self. And that's, and that's part of this being still in mind. There's, in the contemplative tradition, there's the false self is all bound up with these thoughts and preserving itself and having people like me and all of that stuff. Whereas if we can be silent and connect with the true self of the of God, that's, that's the true self. So, so just, by, just by hearing my commentary of some anxiety, I'm not, I'm not identifying with my false self. Okay. Turn to someone behind you, next to you. How was that little experiment for you? Just, just take 30 seconds or so and, and talk about what, what was your commentary? Did you notice it? Were the bubbles going by? <laughs> 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 okay. Back up to God. That could happen a hundred times in one sitting. 
So that's 100 times I could find myself. It's a very small dilemma, but 100 times, thousands of times, tens of thousands of times over a period of years. That's a lot of, that adds up, and it has, it has a transformative effect in my life. I, you know, um, some, sometimes speakers on a Sunday morning will refer to their wife's experience with them, and it becomes kind of a joke, but I would actually, you can ask Vicki, I am different because of this. And different, one of the ways I'm different is that this very process of detaching, if, if I have an initial reaction that this is the way I want to do it, or I don't want to do that, the lapse time between when I, that kicks in and when I let go of it has shrunk. Because I can let go faster. I can shift out of that, let go of it, deny myself. Um, nod your head, dear, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to me, this is, it, it may seem uh, esoteric or odd or abstract. To me, it's a practical way to deny this. It's a practical way to experience this aspect of our, our spiritual journey. What we're going to do now is a, a, a breath prayer. So, breath prayer is one of, the, one of the prayer methods in your discipleship material for this week. And what it, what it involves is um, using, using the breath to be still and, and open back up to God and focus on God. So that when, when all these distracting thoughts are, are hitting us, it's like, oh, return to the breath. And with, with the breath, the, the one that's described this week in your, in your material speaks of breathing in God's love and then relaxing, relaxing into his love and the love filling the room. Sometimes we do breath prayer with, with just a small phrase, and that's what I'd like to do with you this morning. Um, a little further on in that passage in John we were just looking at, in John 15, Jesus says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. You and me, I and you. <clears throat> so I want to use that as a... Let me get some water. I want to use that as... Use that as a phrase for our breath prayer this morning. So in other words, when we return to the breathing from the distracted thought, we're going to breathe in, you and me. We're going to breathe out, I and you. And there's a rhythm to that that goes with your breath. And the rhythm helps let the, the distracted thoughts dissipate and dissolve. Okay. So it's going to be on the in-breath, you and me, and on the out breath, I and you. Now, I'm going to do, I'm going to simulate a breath prayer with you. I'm going to coach you through it, because I'm going to introduce the distracting thought. And you're going to run with it, because your brain will just run with it. It'll have a commentary about it, even if it doesn't go with what my thought is. Um, and then I will bring you back to the breathing, you and me. Okay? So you can, you can get some experience of this. Okay, so to do this, um, first thing, put your feet, both feet on the floor. Sit up straight. You know, get your, get your back against the back of the chair. Or, or, or sit, sit out on the front of your chair, um, straight up. Um, <clears throat> close your eyes. Most conducive to this, close your eyes. And first of all, just become aware of your breath. Don't do anything, just become aware of your breath. Focus on the breath. And then I want you to, on the inhale, breathe, breathe in just a little deeper. And exhale just a little longer than you have now. And now, just, just get into a rhythm with this, of breathing in, you and me, breathe out, I and you. Breathe in, you and me, breathe out, I and you. And just 
Just let that go for a bit. Just keep that rhythm. Okay, first distracting thought. An upcoming event that you are looking forward to. An upcoming event that you are looking forward to. Another distracting thought. A recent disagreement or conflict that you had with somebody. A recent disagreement or conflict that you had with someone. Oh. That thought bubble, return to your breathing. You and me, and I and you. Breathe in, you and me. Breathe out, I and you. Oh, here comes another one. What can I eat for my next meal? Thought bubbles and commentary. Return to your breathing. I, you and me, and I and you. Mmm, it's feeling good. Reminds me of a pleasant memory. A pleasant memory. distracting thought comes in. Something you want to say to somebody but don't know if you can say it or how you would say it. Something difficult that you want to say to somebody but don't know how to say it.
Okay, once more, reach all your breathing. You in me, and I in you. And when you're when you're ready, just open your eyes, come back, come back into the room. So, how is that? What we, what we simulated is fairly typical of this kind of, this kind of prayer practice. These, these thoughts will come in and you'll have to... See, I, I distracted you and I brought you back. When you do this, you can distract yourself and it'll be up to you to come back and return to your, your breathing and your focus. Again, share with somebody. I want you to ask, answer one one question that you share with somebody else. What was the hardest of those distracting thoughts for you to let go of and return to?
my experience is very immediate, and at the same time, I sense this huge, infinite ocean of love. Um, so anyway, I, I encourage you, give it, give it a try. Like Matthew said, well, let's be open. You might have tried it before and it didn't work. You might be in a different place now. You might try it and it might, it might be something that, that um, helps you experience God. Let's, let's pray. Jesus, thank you that uh, your, the ocean of love is there regardless of what we're thinking, regardless of our ability to be still. But we do, we do ask you that you would help us to be still enough on a daily basis to know that you are God, to have a deeper connection with you. Pray that you would give us grace this week as we maybe try something new. And, and we're only trying something new because there's a deep thirst, there's a deep longing in our hearts that only you can satisfy. We pray these things in your name.